Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Hello, Karen. Hey, Dan. How are you doing this morning? I'm a little chilly, honestly. That's right. Yeah, December came on pretty strong and uh, some strong winds and a little light snow. And uh, we're getting close to Christmas, so I guess not too out of the ordinary. Right. And so since we're looking into the winter months, we're becoming less active out in the fields. And so we wanted to start talking about things you can do indoors, like, you know, how to find free money. Everyone likes that topic, right? That's right. And I see you brought in some guests here. Let's get them introduced to, to the listeners out there. That's right. So we have a couple guests today. We have Jacqueline Keen or Jack Keen from the Windsor Group, and she's going to be talking to us about one program from the Department of Agriculture. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And then we also have two folks from WVU Extension. We have Brian Wickline, who is a extension agent down in Monroe County. Welcome, Brian. Thank you for having us. And then we have Lisa Jones, who is the program coordinator for the WVU Extension Small Farm Center. Good morning. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, sounds like we got some great people on board. So let's let's get on with uh, probing their brains and giving us some good direction and some insight on some really good programs. Right. The reason we chose this show topic for today was there's this huge initiative from the federal government called Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities. And it is a national program. It covers 55 states and territories. And there's 105 different projects, 92 major commodities are covered, and 178 NRCS practices are covered. And so it's really a broad topic, which is really fun for this show, because I know that we go out to a larger area than our you know, little Ohio Valley here. And so this is one of those shows that our entire listening area, uh, sorry, Canada, not you, um, <laughs> can get into. But um, but yeah, so the programs that are out there are, are really amazing because they are designed to help us start capturing carbon, to help improve our grazing practices, to help improve our farming technologies, but also I mentioned earlier, it's available in 55 states and territories, but it's also available to our tribal areas. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about the negligence that we've given to some of our farming communities that we haven't been, they haven't really been eligible for federal funding, or they may have experienced some discrimination from that federal funding. And so Jacqueline or Jack, do you want to tell us a little bit about the program that you're working with? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm an outreach specialist with the Windsor Group LLC. The Windsor Group was contracted by the USDA to administer the Discrimination Financial Assistance Program, also known as DFAP. DFAP came about from Section 22007 of the Inflation Reduction Act and provides $2.2 billion for financial assistance to farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners who experience discrimination by a USDA farm loan program administered by the Farm Service Agency, or FSA, or its predecessor, the Farmers Home Administration, prior to January 2021. Now, when we talk about discrimination as it relates to a loan program, it can extend beyond race, gender, disability, et cetera. It could also be in the application process itself, whereby a potential applicant doesn't even apply because he or she knows other farmers within the area or in a similar situation that were denied or were refused to accept their application without proper review and decisioning. It can also be with the loan itself, whereby a farmer received adverse loan terms, such as a higher interest rate, shorter term, being required to over collateralize the loan, or even taking too long to decision or fund the loan, causing a delay in planting crops. 
The deadline to apply for this program is January 13th. And I want to ensure all of our farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners are aware of this financial assistance program they could potentially benefit from. If you would like more information on the program, please visit the National DFAP website at 22007apply.gov or by calling 1-800-721-0970. And if you know of any former or retired farmers, ranchers, or forest landowners, I ask that you please make them aware of this program. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. So these are ag loans that you're just talking about, or are they um, federal grants? Loans. Okay. Loans that were administered by the FSA. Okay, and and those can be really critical, especially when you know we're talking about beginning farmers and just getting things off the ground. There's there's plenty of good research out there with the Extension Services, USDA, Soil and Water, really good practices and a lot of uh, I want to say like small farm management courses that people can take that really even though you know a loan's not necessarily well farming's not necessarily guaranteed not by any means but as far as like planning ahead sometimes you need that extra bit of money to to be able to move your operation forward and with that momentum you know with the proper management again the education's out there everyone can be successful yes so thank you for that my pleasure. Yeah. And for those of you who are just tuning in, it is a uh, opportunity for you to maybe go back and get redressed for uh, either being intimidated or maybe just not wanting to go through the program because you didn't think you had a chance. And so if you were looking at the FSA loan program at some point in the past, it's a good idea to and didn't get funding or got a bad loan or something. It's a good idea to just reach out and talk to Jack and find out, you know, what the program that she's monitoring can do for you, if anything. What's a good contact for you? Sure. So I can best be reached by email because I'm on the road traveling doing outreach right now. And so my email address is Jacqueline, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E dot Keen, K-E-E-N-E at Windsor, W-I-N-D-S-O-R group, G-R-O-U-P dash L-L-C dot com. And again, you can also call the 800 number, which was 1-800-721-0970. And they could probably help you as well, or I know they will help you as well. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. And I really think it's an important option for people to look into. You know, as far as like examples go, Jacqueline, one that comes to mind, you were talking about ranchers specifically, you know, we've shown again and again that uh, is storing your hay like in a building. So it does, so it's not weathered, especially if it's not something that you're setting out for grazing purposes to, to live stockpile as an example. But if you just kind of want to keep hay and keep the quality up, we've shown research that basically the building will pay itself off in a matter of a few years. And, you know, a loan would make perfect sense for something like that. And in a few years, you could pay back the loan. And essentially, as the equation works with the research, you've paid off not only the loan, but also uh, you've gotten back that quality. So you've even gained a little bit extra. And in the long run, you're obviously going to win. So it's just a great opportunity to take advantage of that kind of research and really just enhance your operation in multiple levels. Absolutely. Right. And so for some of the more localized areas, we wanted to bring this great big opportunity for funding. You know, you have the reparations opportunity and we also have this climate smart funding. And so we're really the federal government's really trying to um, make some stuff happen. The Inflation Reduction Act really is pushing a lot of funds back into the hands of Americans so that we can better our environments and better our communities. And so one of the things that we're doing here in West Virginia, Brian and Lisa worked on a fantastic grant opportunity for 
Appalachia in for the Appalachian counties of Virginia and West Virginia. So, of course, West Virginia being the only state that is 100 percent within Appalachia. So all West Virginia counties. But we also have several Virginia counties that are also tied into this grazing for Appalachian sustainability. Do you guys want to tell us a little bit about this program? Yeah, thanks for giving a little intro there. So you are absolutely correct. This particular project that we're going to discuss is for all of West Virginia and for the 25 counties of Virginia and their independent cities. So we're hoping to target 135 farmers in the central Appalachian region of these two states, and many of which for us, they're, they really are small and underserved farmers. So they really make sense for both of these programs that we're discussing here today. The goal is over five years, we are hoping to support and really empower these farmers with technical assistance, marketing opportunities to help shift some more conventional management practices to what we're calling climate smart practices on these working land. So on these farms, on these small farms. And through this, we're hoping to help reduce those greenhouse gases and increase carbon sequestration. That really is the goal of our particular project from production through marketing that we're really doing some hands-on stuff. And of course, everybody's like, well, what does climate smart practices mean? I'm like, well, it is naming for a lot of the practices that you've probably heard about that really, I think, Extension has been pushing for years <laughs> and NRCS has been pushing for years. So it's things like prescribed grazing and nutrient management and pasture hay planting, silva pasture, and we're even helping pay for some of those supportive pieces like fencing and water to get those practices established. So if you say rotational grazing, I'll be like, yes, that is a climate smart practice that will help cover. So we're looking at those working lands in these two states, in this mid-Atlantic region, and really we're looking at the soil. So we are studying the soil on, on farms, and then we're helping move these cattle with some of our marketing partners on this project. And that way we are taking advantage of where we are situated within this portion of the US and how many millions of people live really close by. And that way we can, we can grow the product right here at home. And you can either do direct to consumer sales or work with our marketing partners. And that way we can move these animals further uh, up and down the East Coast. So I asked Brian to be here today because he's worked so much on this marketing piece and knows so much more than I do when it comes to the marketing piece. Brian, if you want to chime in. <laughs> sure. So if, if we look at the interest over the last few years, as far as uh, grass finished or pasture finished beef, there's been an increase in that interest. And, but a lot of it's done individually in niche marketing type situations where producers are selling to consumers. And that's great. If, if we look at the profitability of those farms, they're extremely profitable. I do quite a bit of financial work with producers. And if, if we look at some of that data, those folks that are doing direct marketing to consumers generally have higher rates of return than if we look at the conventional market. Now, there's other things involved in there as far as the time and marketing and and uh, working with consumers. And, and so what we really haven't had the opportunity is, is really large scale grass-fed marketing type programs. And so what this grant does is give, it gives producers the opportunity to have an outlet to market into an existing program. And so we have partnered with a company out of Asheville, North Carolina called Hickory Nut Gap. And those folks are uh, marketing in the southern part of the state, southeastern part, and have developed some really good relationships with Whole Foods, Ingalls, grocery stores. And so they developed a really good retail market. And that, uh, from a producer producer standpoint, me being one, you know, sometimes we're more production oriented than we are, you know, working with consumers and, and speaking with folks. And so folks that might have an interest in focusing just on the production aspect and letting somebody else do the marketing, maybe this might be an opportunity for them. So just another avenue for folks to take the opportunity for a, another niche market for them. Brian, you're, you're so right about that, especially in smaller farms. Farming has become an addition to your full-time job. So 
you get in the mindset of, you know, you go to your job, you get home, you know, you take care of the cows, you take care of the kids, take care of the kids, the family. Right. Right. And that marketing piece that, you know, takes so much forethought and planning does get kind of pushed to the side. And it's really unfortunate because in the long run, a lot of people don't necessarily gain the economic potential of their operation, not because it's poorly managed, but just because that piece is just so hard to fit in. And it's hard putting all the effort to producing it, to producing a quality product. So it is, you know, what you're saying about getting help with the marketing part, I think would make sense for so many people out there. Yeah, I, I think it's a great opportunity. And, you know, the folks that do participate in this grant by no means have to market through this program, but we're just, we're providing them an outlet for that. And you made a good point. We do have a lot of folks that are part-time farmers and they've got an off-farm job. And so what we want to try to do with this program is to maybe give folks the opportunity to earn some extra income. A lot of us that are farming and have off-farm jobs don't necessarily want to be on those off-farm jobs. They want to be there working on the farm and maybe we can have the opportunity to change some some lives and where folks can maybe actually live off the farm and, and earn a decent living from that. Yeah, great opportunities for sure. Lisa, I did have a question. You know, you're talking about carbon sequestration and I know we typically think about planting trees for something like that, right? You put a tree in the ground and as it grows, it sequester carbon and then you get timber. That thought has evolved quite a bit. Do you have uh, other forms of carbon sequestration that wasn't typically thought of as carbon sequestration, you know, five, 10 years ago? Well, I'll let you know up front that I am not the soil scientist, but I can speak to this just a tiny bit. Uh, <laughs> there, there are other people with expertise years beyond mine. But what I've learned recently is that we talk about carbon sometimes like this novel thing, but carbon makes up all of life, which I think is why we think of trees we're like, oh, we're planting something in the ground and it's made of carbon, right? So that's that's a source. But carbon is everywhere. It is all around us all the time. We are made of <laughs> something we're made of. But that but for our particular project, we are looking at how we are putting carbon in the ground where it already is, but we are using unfortunately what are some pretty poor soils that we have and really taking advantage of all of the things we can put into our soil to better them. And really, that's the goal here, because we talk about this project. And yes, it does focus on cattle and beef. However, I'm not studying the cattle and the beef that are on it. I want to know what we can do to really be better soil farmers and forage farmers, right? What are we doing to enhance our poor soils? And that way they can actually suck in more carbon. Now, I, I know if you if you sit down with a bunch of foresters and soil scientists, they're going to tell you that, you know, there are certain ways to capture carbon. Some of them, like soils, takes a lot longer. So for us, five years is is like we need all of that time to really see a little bit of change as opposed to growing a tree where you can measure that in a particular way. Where, where things like carbon, your soil, I mean, something like that, you might want to study it over millennia like people do with core samples, right? But you can look at carbon all across your, your biosphere, your ecosystem, and look at different ways to suck in carbon. Now, I would definitely tell you to go ask some foresters about their opinions on it because they've, <laughs> they vary a lot. And I learned a lot at a recent uh, forest carbon management conference about the different ways to sequester carbon. But again, that is that is not my area of expertise. Uh, I, I <laughs> hey, at least I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> oh, yeah, you did. Well, That's OK. But not, That's OK. But not in a bad way. I'm at. That's OK. Like things like no-till, for instance, you know, you're talking about the root production, you know, every time, every till the soil, you turn it over, right? It mm -hmm. releases carbon dioxide, you lose organic matter, like through the tillage process. And that's where the no-till part comes in. And, you know, you, you kind of keep that carbon in the ground. Some other things that we were looking at, like at Ohio State, I want to say it's down in Jackson, Southern Ohio, 
is uh, they're they're using warm season native grasses, those prairie grasses that put down those four or five foot roots into the ground as another way to um, enhance that carbon sequestration part of farming, utilizing those warm season grasses to put more than just six to 10 inches of, of good root system like in a pasture field, but something that can go really deep. And you were saying it seems like a small change, but if you're thinking about if everyone implements that, if everybody watches their erosion, if everyone doesn't over till those things will really add up and everybody does a little bit, you can, you can do quite a lot, especially if we're talking about global atmospheres that are all connected. So, you know, around the world, if everybody does a little bit, it'll change the environment for everybody. Well, and I think you guys are making some really good points. And that's one component of this grant is the educational aspect. I think in the last five years, we've we've really changed some attitudes towards grazing. And, you know, from an extension standpoint, I think our roles in general are to keep our producers on the farm and help them be sustainable, both environmentally and economically. And, th- and that's kind of what we're trying to achieve with this with this grant is, number one, we're trying to give folks an opportunity to to get into a niche market type situation where maybe they can be a little more profitable. And the other thing is, like you all have been talking about, is the environmental aspect. And, you know, we've brought out some good points about carbon sequestration. And we know it takes a lot of time to change or actually to see uh, some carbon changes. But from an organic matter standpoint, if we really look at that, we can we can make some organic matter changes relatively quick through management practices. And we know, depending upon soil types, that we can increase water holding capacity. We can increase nutrient holding capacity. And as we see issues with climate change, those are two things that are really huge right now. The cost of fertilizer, potential droughts that, that happen. And so if we can help folks try to focus on a couple of those, those attributes by increasing water holding capacity, nutrient holding capacity, those are things that also can make us kind of from a secondary effect more profitable in the future. And so with this grant, we're really trying to focus on management and We've got some folks that are really doing a great job grazing, but it's something that we can always continuously improve on. We know financially there's a direct correlation between the number of bales fed to profitability. And so the more we are actually feeding mechanically harvested feeds, there's a higher potential of us not being quite as profitable as what what we could be or should be. And so... Number one, we, we want to try to decrease those feeding costs by, by having folks concentrate more on either mob grazing or intense management, intensive grazing, and decrease feeding. Hopefully try to get to maybe a 300-day 300, 300 grazing season or even more. I just went, oh, a couple months ago, I went into the, to the central part of the state, and we were doing a grazing school there, and, and we were on a particular farm that uh, that individual was Actually, last year he grazed year round, and I mean that's just a, a great feat that that somebody within the state has uh, has been able to accomplish that. And so, I mean, just you look at you look at the savings that a producer can have, not having to worry about putting up hay, not having to worry about feeding hay. Yeah, you're going to have some time invested in moving fence and that kind of thing. But man, it's just a feed cost is our number one cost from a producer standpoint. If we can really decrease those, we can we can really help folks be more sustainable in the long run. Yeah. And these programs that are out there cover much more than just beef and grass. So if you are looking for a program to cover your commodity or to see what's available in your state, make sure that you visit Solutions for Climate Smart Commodities and find their project dashboard. From there, you can actually select your state to find out what's going on in your state, or you can select your commodity to just narrow it down and find out what is available to you as a producer. And of course, we also don't want to forget about the program that Jack talked about earlier and to check out to see if you are eligible to participate in that program. Please visit the website of 22007apply.gov. And you can scroll down and find out what you're eligible for. And I do want to point out that even if you were a would-be farmer and you didn't get into agriculture because you were denied an FSA or a um, Farmer's Home Administration loan, then this is still a potential avenue for you. So it's not just for people who are actively farming, but even if you would have been 
a farmer, but you weren't because of this discrimination, then you really should look into this. And do check out the different opportunities that are available to you. There is a lot of money out there to help improve our farms. And I really think that every farmer who is listening to this show, if you do not go look at this funding opportunity or reach out to your local extension office to find out what funding opportunities are available to you, that you are leaving money on the table that could help your farm. So I really want to encourage you to look into these different programs and try, try to apply and and see what happens. If you need any help, you always have your local extension office available to you. And uh, we would be more than happy to assist you. And our guests, thank you so much for the show. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thank you for having us. Hey, friends, we need your help. In order to help keep this show going, we need to hear back from you. Please take some time and check out our evaluation. Let us know if you've used any of the information you've gained from our show. Once again, you can reach us directly. You can call Karen at 304-234-3673. That's 304-234-3673. Or you can reach Dan at 740-695-1455. That's 740-695-1455. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.